Well, hello, everyone. I am That Weems Guy here for episode 25. And joining me today is Brian Eastridge. And this brings Brian into a tie with uh, Eric Gellhouse. So Bulky gets to take his first drink of the day because we've mentioned Gellhouse. So this brings you into a tie with, with Bulky, Gellhouse, Cagle, uh, and you are 0.33 behind Hearn because he's only taken a third credit for the for the four person episode. And I guess it puts you in a tie with John Holston. Wow, that is a uh that is quite the motley crew to be uh, associated right. with there. All right, I got to well, get a hold of her in one of these days and get him on my podcast. Cause I, I, he and I are both kind of turbo nerds in the information <laughs> world, I guess you could say of, of like researching something to pieces. So. All right. Well, Brian, we may have some people that are joining because the audience has grown since your last uh, appearance. So go ahead and uh, give an intro to the audience real quick. Well, uh, Brian with a Y. Everybody always asks me that. And they spell it wrong on my coffee cup, so I had to make my own coffee. Um, let's see. I've been a cop 19 years as of uh, like three days ago. So uh, hopefully on the back side of that deal, uh, I own part of EDC Belt Company. And oh, what other hats do I wear? I'm still doing the training gigs, not as much as I was doing them last year and the year before because of uh, belt company growth. And then I do the off duty on duty podcast and, uh, you know, shot PPC. I never really shot bullseye much, but I shot a lot of their guns, uh, worked on, I, it's something I keep forgetting to throw out. You know, everybody wants to hear about the shooting accolades. And I'm like, well, in 2006, uh, I went up to cylinder and slide and learned to build 1911. So I've been doing that off and on for was that 15 years? Golly, that yeah. goes fast. So, uh, and I grew up in a gun shop uh, for several years there. Uh, I was probably the only seven-year-old kid that knew the difference in like a, a 19 and a 14 and a 15 and I guess 64, 65, 66, and could uh, tell most adults the differences. So that was kind of an thanks, dad, you know, <laughs> so it was a good experience. And you are the host of the On Duty, Off Duty podcast. It's Off Duty, On Duty. Off Duty, On Duty. Uh, Same yes, thing. Off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see the closer I get to that 20 mark, the more Off Duty I yeah. feel like it's getting. So. All right. Now I got to put a little pressure on you. Okay. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. All right. Your previous experience, uh, previous episode here, uh, 176 plays as of right now on the podcast feed. Now okay. the YouTube feed got several hundred more that you could add to that um there have been multiple episodes since then that have topped the 200 mark all right and bulky's episode has actually topped the 300 mark now the episode that debuted yesterday with wayne and daryl which will probably get brought up in this this talk is currently at 182 podcast plays, so it'll hit over 200 uh, by, yeah, well, by, by the end of the week so the pressure is on for you to keep the 200 plus streak alive. Well, you know, when you, when you have such a luminary on your, <laughs> uh, when you have a luminary of the industry on, um, you know, you, it's to be expected. And, right. uh, Wayne's episode, when I had him on my podcast solo, because, uh, him and Daryl, I never could get the timing right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I had him on mine, that, that to date, I think is still the highest downloaded, and I want to say it's pushing 2000 now. So thanks, Wayne. Yeah. Appreciate that one. <laughs> and that's why he's a luminary. It's why he's, he's luminous. Luminous. There you go. Luminous luminary. There you go. All right. Uh, you just took part in the first guardian conference. Tell our audience about that. Yeah. So concealedcarry.com, who uh, actually is the network host of uh, the off duty on duty podcast with uh, they, they host mine on their network and then Rob Beckman firearms trainers podcast, which I know you've been on. It seems like you've been on there a couple of I have, times. I haven't been on that one. I've listened to it. But oh, I haven't been I'm on there. call Rob tonight. <laughs> I'm going to pass your information to Rob tonight. Um, and, and to Rob's credit, he's like hyper organized and he's probably got episodes all the way through like February of next year. And I'm struggling to get two out a month, three a month right now, but um, 
and then they do the concealed carry podcast and then their uh their membership students uh, is guardian nation and that's kind of their um I don't, I don't like to say paywall but it's it's a, a membership program that they get some exclusive content and uh i've been on that a few times well anyway uh riley bowman who's a, a dear friend now uh a year ago we all met up here in oklahoma city and with their vision of doing a conference a, a gathering that was kind of centered towards the guardian nation membership but also open enrollment and it first one out of the out of the gate it was a huge success um i had never taught at a conference before i've always had just an open enrollment eight hour eight to ten hour block uh, i've done a couple of two two day classes and i gotta say four four hour blocks i did two friday and two sunday and i was smoked it was uh, -huh. uh took a pretty good toll on me there had michael burgess from uh, north carolina um, i imported my ai <laughs> <laughs> who ended up doing a fair amount of teaching. So, uh, you know, he got the, the whole conference experience and, and it was a really well orchestrated, well executed, uh, conference, uh, that was unlike some of the other conferences I had been to before. So, um, I was, I was glad to see it, it was kind of refreshing. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't all your top 1% of 1% of shooters, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a little more mass market concealed carrier. And it was a good mix of they can dip their toe in the pool, or they can train with a Matthew Little, Chuck Haggard, kind of, you know, somebody who's maybe uh, a little uh, caters to a little more experience, mm -hmm. so to speak. And all points in between. So it was a, it was a great conference and I really enjoyed it. And I hope it comes back to Oklahoma next year uh, because it's only a 30 minute drive for me. So, <laughs> yeah. You think, know, yeah. I've been teaching at TAC con since 15, 2015. Yeah. And conference audiences for your classes can, can be extremely difficult because as wide ranging as, the talent level or the skill level may be in an open enrollment or experience level. I guess it'd be a better way to say that in an open enrollment class that is magnified in a conference class. And sometimes I think instructors tend to over, I know I've done it overestimate what you can do in a two hour block. Yeah. And so that that's been one of my things from learning at a conference is you know, if I'm presenting a live fire block at a conference, I scale back very much on what I think my expectations are what I can get done in two hours. Yeah. And that, that was a very eye opening experience, but I I've kind of taken, I don't know, lit my own torch with, let me declutter a lot of these things mm -hmm. uh, so that you know, like, the way I structure a class, I can tailor it to skill levels. Um, and then through the lecture portion and interactive lecture, which I'm really, really big on, uh, is to demystify some of the stuff. And what I found was I was getting a lot more questions from people who were uh, quasi instructor level students uh, that, that were I don't want to say that they were offended, but they were just really inquisitive about it. And then the newer students, I got a lot of good feedback on, you know, Hey, you know, I've struggled with all these things uh -huh. and you kind of unlock why we teach certain things. And it's weird. I got Michael Burgess is one of my dearest friends on earth. And, you know, we talk about, uh, his wife teaches uh, special education, special needs children and how they present them information in a completely reverse principle. Backwards right? chaining. Yes. You teach them to uh, make up the bed by starting with a made up bed. Right. Um, so when I started like the lecture, like developing a lecture, 
uh, I kind of harken back to like in school, I was terrible at math. I had a really like a mental block on math and not that it rose to the level of needing like tutoring or anything, but it was extremely difficult for me. And then I go to cylinder and slide and I start learning about dovetails and angles and 330 by 60 by, and, I, and it, it clicks. Yeah. And it was like, okay, well, now I see the execution of why. Yeah. So I started breaking the fundamentals apart piece by piece by piece using the dictionary some and, and explaining the why behind every single facet of it. And uh, even the instructor level was like, uh, half of them were like, well, I don't yeah. even know this stuff because it's what I've been told to teach and how I teach. They're at the bottom end of the Bloom's taxonomy triangle, and they're in the basically the repeat mode of learning. They're not up in the analyzing and creating mode of knowledge or learning. And so th that's the difference between, I think, true instruction and people with a certificate. Well, I think your master's degree just stuck out on me there mm -hmm. for a minute. Because <laughs> I, but, but yeah, I get, yeah. I absolutely. Never, uh, what did you uh, call it? The something taxonomy? Bloom's of, taxonomy. Now you're going to get give me another research project. <laughs> that I stumped Dave Spalding with that the other day. And yes. uh, in, a, in a conversation, he, and he sent me a thank you note. You know, I am so glad that at 60s, whatever years of age that he is now, I learned something new. I thought I had, had seen everything I could see on teaching and learning. And, you know, uh, for our audience, we've mentioned it on the audio, the podcast several times. Bloom's taxonomy is basically it's like measuring the levels of learning. And the bottom of that is you're just remembering facts. And it's like you're cramming for a test. I just wrote it down. on my target, <laughs> yeah. so. And then the next level above that is that you can repeat back what you've been told. And quite frankly, that's what a lot of the canned uh, instructor programs out there like NRA, USCCA, whatever. Um, you know, if all your teaching knowledge is based on, I went to this instructor class and you don't have experience and you don't have, you know, a significant depth of knowledge to take that and apply it and create and synthesize, you're just repeating back what you've been told. And you and I as law enforcement, quite frankly, that's what most of our training is, is we, as Wayne Dobbs would say, because, you know, he is a luminary, right. uh, cops get sent to a two-week school, and they're considered an expert in a field. Yeah, that, and yeah. there's a lot of that. And, you know, in the firearms training world, people go to a three-day instructor class, and they consider themselves the expert in the field. And, mm -hmm. well, I'm an instructor. Well, are you? Yeah, I have a I have a very dear friend that is a uh, federally recognized expert on use of force. Mm -hmm. um, it, empty hand, hand it, the whole gamut. And uh, in a conversation, we were talking about uh, his, you know, what he charges for expert testimony, um, and it came up that he was he was actually in more demand than a brain surgeon. And I said, how is that possible? And he goes, there's a lot more brain surgeons than there are federally recognized use of force experts in mm -hmm. the United States. Yep. I, I, I had no, I had no, uh, no idea that that was the case, but, uh, but yeah, and it's, it's pretty endemic in law enforcement to, you know, go through a certification and then you're expected to be able to regurgitate and teach that and you get that constant uh there's no real evolution in it it just right. it just is it's face value at, at what it is and uh you know I, I have i have i've started to come to realize that i have a pretty good depth of knowledge uh for <laughs> for somebody that's been in the law enforcement realm for so long that you know it didn't come overnight yeah. even though i've been quasi firearms instructor for 16 years it's only been in about the last five years that i've i've had a the historical perspective the uh the mechanical perspective all you know 
the mechanical application of the gun, ammunition, reloading, uh -huh. physically building a firearm, all of those things equate to a depth of knowledge that I can't give somebody in a two day class. Right. <laughs> you know? and, so, and I think we can put it in these terms. We've all been in the class where the instructor and regardless of topic stood in the room and read the PowerPoint slide to you. Well, I can read the PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. I can read the book. And I will admit that sometimes when I get stuck teaching a state mandated class and I have to go with the state mandated program, occasionally sometimes I'm sitting there looking at the PowerPoint slide going, yeah, you know, and versus when I put together my own presentation, a slide just may be a picture. And that picture is just to remind me what was coming next in my presentation. And then I I teach. I'm not just reading off the PowerPoint slide. Right. The slide is just there to give me a visual reference. And you know, it gives the students a visual reference too because it's about the subject matter, but it's not bullet points. It's not just text up there on the slide. And to me, that's the difference between truly knowing your material and teaching and just being the person that got stuck in front of the room. Yeah. Yep. The other thing with the conference format that mm -hmm. I had to, uh, I had to really rehearse and really go through was I didn't have a PowerPoint. Uh -huh. I couldn't, there was no physical right. way to do that. And I, I do, like you said, I use a lot of pictures and then sometimes I'll use bullet phrases to kind of, mm -hmm. okay, hit this high point and teaching off a whiteboard. Um, and then I had a couple of pictures on my phone of, of, Mm -hmm. people that had historical lineage in the fundamental teaching of, of handgun shooting that I was able to show, but it, which was I really eye opening for some people, but, but having to pitch that lecture and adjust it to the audience was really a challenge. And uh, because I had found I'd gotten spoiled to, okay, here's the skill builder one PowerPoint. Okay. Uh -huh. And then I talked through all that. So well, when I didn't have that stuff, it was like, okay, I've got to draw an outline again and, and really try to tailor this lecture wise. And then if my lecture is not complete by the time this guy over here starts shooting, the lecture is going to go real bad. So it was uh, first day was a real learning experience. And uh, none of the four classes got the exact same class. Right. which I was kind of, I kind of prided myself on. I was like, Hey, that's kind of cool. I was able to adjust this, uh, you know, this beta test on day one to fit three other blocks. And, right. you know, a lot of that was due to Michael's help too, because, you know, juggling loading magazines and range time and breaks and all that. And uh, I tell people when <laughs> an AI is like uh, when you take your kids to the bowling alley, and they go, okay, you got a three-year-old. We're going to put the air-filled bumpers down the lane so they don't just roll gutters the whole time. That's the way a good AI should be. Here's the train tracks. You're going to stay in the middle of them, and I'm going to keep you there. Um, not just, hey, this guy over here is being unsafe. Pull him off the line. So uh, big kudos to Michael. You're going to have to get him on your show at some point because he's uh, his depth of knowledge for or communicating to students is unbelievable. Um, and uh, probably one of the best instructors I've ever been around. And very few people know who he is at this point. So <laughs> well, speaking of Michael, and I know he's from North Carolina mm -hmm. and I know the conference was in Oklahoma. Yeah. Did he experience God's love in the form of Brahms while he was there? We did not have time. I'll put it to you that way. We had, um, we were up at five 45 every morning and we were rolling into bed about 10, between 10 30 and midnight. So, uh, and the conference, they provided, uh, mm -hmm. like a continental breakfast and a lunch. And then we had obligatory dinners to go to, um, a VIP dinner that was uh -huh. really excellent. Uh, the instructor like introduction dinner, and then uh, we got one night, or actually two nights. And one of the nights, a dear friend of mine took us to a uh, very high-end steakhouse that 
I love Muchly. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we only had one free night and that one free night, uh, my, my, my gal and her sister cooked a dinner for us and we were so exhausted. They were just putting plates in front of us and taking them away. And, you know, we're guzzling water and trying to get back ready for the next day. So, uh, all right, well, Michael, all if you go back to Oklahoma, uh, you've got to go to Brahms. And if Brian doesn't take you, just go on your own. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, Lee, I had the timeline worked out and that timeline went away with a quickness mm -hmm. and it, we hit the ground running and, uh, I had to go back to work and I dropped him off at the airport while I was at work. And, uh, I had, I had no recovery time. And he, mm -hmm. he called me the next day and said, man, I haven't gotten up from my recliner in like three days. <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah for those of you that go to a conference and you see your instructor looks a wee bit road worn it, it's mm -hmm. no i think it was harder to do that than it was a uh open enrollment class by a lot yeah, so. yeah. It, it, the, the conference atmosphere is just so much harder uh staying mentally locked on uh yeah. just just to walk from one side of the range to the other takes 45 minutes or so because of all the people that you see that you stop and say hey to or whatever and the mm -hmm. or a conversation you hear and you join in or whatever and then you have to turn that off and go turn your brain back on to your subject matter as you get ready to teach and that's why i've gotten like a tack con uh i don't attend the class in the block right before i'm going to teach mm -hmm. unless uh i did make an exception this year with uh, uh steve moses was teaching a class that i really wanted to take and it was on the same range that i was teaching on yeah. And so I was able to do that and then stay right there and go right into my class. But typically I won't teach in the time frame, the time block just before, excuse me, I won't take a class just in the time block before I'm scheduled to teach so that I can spend that time getting my mind right. And then a lot of times, as soon as I'm done teaching, I don't want to do anything right after that either. Uh, just because my mind is still locked in them to the, to the class. And it's just kind of pointless at that point. I'm going to throw a shout out to Chuck Haggard, who's right. like the busiest man in show business. Uh, he and I got to catch up several times between breaks and stuff. And I said, man, this thing where this is really wearing me out. He, and he gave me a, a golden piece of advice that uh, the first class I did, I didn't, I didn't do that. The second one, I started to, you know, I came out of the, the throttle a little earlier and he said, build yourself about 30 or 45 minutes to just engage with your students at the end. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I go, okay, what's your, what's your reasoning behind that? He goes, I like to eat lunch. And sometimes it's real hard to do when you're getting, <laughs> when you're corralled into a corner by people that are being mm -hmm. legitimately inquisitive. So, yeah. uh, so I did that. I, I ch changed the lecture tempo and, uh, drove the class a little bit different that from there on out. So thanks, Chuck. Appreciate that. Um, and, and it is about the students. So you want to be able to give them that time. Mm -hmm. so, and quite uh, frankly, that's where more of the learning occurs than standing on the line, pressing a trigger a lot of the time. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the other thing that my class, I tailored it, you know, come one, come all, all skill levels. I'll, I'll challenge you in some way or challenge your thinking about something. And, uh, this is something I do in skill builder one, but it's my show. You already paid me. So you're going to listen to it anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you're going to, you're going to get it whether you wanted it or not. And it's going to be what it is. But, uh, in that, in that particular format, uh, Michael and I discussed it beforehand. He goes, what's your expectations? And I was like, that's a good question. I expect we'll get here. And he goes, no, of the students. I was like, Ooh, Ooh, I'd never really looked at it from that view. And uh, so he took the reins on that and he goes, here's, here's our expectations for the first lecture. He says, don't shoot yourself. Don't shoot one of us and don't shoot anybody else. Okay. Expectation number two, you've already met you're here. And it was like, man, this huge weight came off of everybody uh -huh. in the class and I could see it. And it was like, there was no, you should have these performance measures. And right. I'm like, got a gun, got a holster, got mags. All right, let's go do do some work. Um, so that was, that was an interesting thing. And I think I'm going to really, um, cause I've never put expectations out before. Right. And, and there's, and then I start reading other people's blocks and classes 
And it's, uh, it, it was interesting to see that a lot of them have, okay, students are expected to be, da, 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 you know, on and on down the list. Uh -huh. And uh, I thought, no, oh, I've never answered that question for anyone before. So, so there you go. If I'm teaching skill builder one, your expectation is show up on time, have gun, will travel. Right. There you go. So. All right. You mentioned just a second ago that you said for all the skill levels, you know, to come and that you would get, hopefully they would get some benefit because you would challenge their thinking on things. What is one thing in which you challenge people's thinking? Um, I challenge the fundamentals and specifically the one about trigger control, right. because that's the one that we all like to take the baseball bat out and beat people over the head with. Um, that one is probably the number one thing that I will, I will show you what you've heard ad nauseum and the context that we need to put that in the file folder. We need mm -hmm. to put it in for our learning, uh, which is, I, I've seen a lot of instructors that don't, and that's not a knock at them. You don't know what you don't know and you don't look at it from ways if it works for you. Right. So I take it from the perspective of who wrote that. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, who wrote the, who wrote the, the, who decided to put that in the fundamentals and under what context was that? And most people don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, let's talk post-World War I civilian marksmanship training corps. Who did they lean on to write that to give it mass market audience? Bullseye so shooters. We, there you go. So it's really critical to be in line with the gun in a manner that when you press the trigger, it doesn't misalign it. You're shooting a 230 grain ball or 185 grain wad cutter, you know, with like two grains of kitty litter behind it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of important things that go on in that. Um, pinning the trigger, you know, I, I'd never... I knew kind of the revolver DASA transition methodology, uh -huh. um, but that's not where I learned it. I learned that from a bullseye shooter and then a six inch 1911 shooter shooting PPC. So why do you do that? They go, well, when you file them hammer hooks down just right, if you don't hold the trigger back when the gun goes boom, it may go boom again when the gun locks up. But if you've got the disconnect pulled, it won't. I went. Well, I didn't know that until I went to a 1911 class on how to build them. So it's like, there's a little bit of that depth of knowledge that I can sprinkle out there and people start to understand, uh -huh. oh, these are why we've been told these things. And it's been perpetuated out of context. Yep. Or it got lost in the translation or over time. Exactly. So there's one for your notebook, folks. Uh, don't file down the hammer hooks on a 1911. <laughs> I, I see, I see bullseye shooters to this day with the hammer forward on their gun, load a magazine and pull the trigger and cycle it and chamber it just in case the thing breaks away oh. or to prevent it from doing so. Right. And it's like, Ooh, Hey, so that's probably trigger control is the one that I, I, I kind of redefine it. And I say, I want to control the trigger to fire the cartridge exactly at the moment that the sites are where I want them. Totally counterintuitive to the way the fundamentals were written, right? Because uh -huh. they were written by people in context shooting 50 yard bullseye, yeah. uh, high power match rifles at 600 meters plus for mass market consumption. We got to train people on how to do this. So here's our target shooters and this is what they find important. So that's one that, I think everybody gets a real, like, it's like a bomb goes off next to them or something. That, you can't take away that sacred thing that we have. That's the blanket we sleep under. And when you steal the, you know, when you steal a little kid's blanket, they get upset about it. You know, it's like, uh, they, to use the parlance of like dealing with children, but, uh, but that one really seems to incense people. And, um, 
Oh, are you still there? I lost. Yeah, you. I'm still here. So okay. I just said, but that, that would be one trigger control. I like to burn that one absolutely mm -hmm. to the ground and then build, rebuild it. So, yeah. Uh, I remember having so-called instructors telling me that, you know, you're jerking the trigger, you're jerking the trigger. And that's why those shots are going low left and right in the shooter. Well, it's not from jerking the trigger. It's from moving the gun with your grip before you press the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, right at, when or you're as you're it. pressing the trigger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or as uh, you're doing it. And I can show you without even touching the trigger, manipulating the grip. Okay. Watch this. Where's my hand going? Am I doing anything that's pressing the trigger? All I'm doing is tightening my hand and look how much my index fingers are moving, which that's going to be totally useless for our people in our podcast land. But for the YouTube audience, they saw that. Um, yeah. yeah, that's low and left. That's why your shot goes left. Is because you tightened your hand, your entire hand, as you press the trigger. Either one, because that's how our hand works naturally, or two, you're trying to anticipate the recoil of the shot going off. Yeah. Subconsciously. And you have to learn to separate the grip from the trigger press. Yeah. Grip, grip then press. Yeah. Instead of, instead of grip and press. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I had one, one individual that had it, had it so bad that uh, I took, you know, I had him hold the trigger at the uh, sear engagement point mm -hmm. and let go with all the other fingers in front of every other student. They're like, oh boy. And I said, I've been doing this drill 16 years and nobody's dropped a gun yet. So don't make mm -hmm. a fool out of me. And this student reacts to a timer, yanks the trigger in 0.14 reaction time holds onto the gun and has it reset, realigned and back on the, the wall and center punches a one inch dot at five yards and goes, mm -hmm. uh, how did that happen? Well, you didn't have anything else on the gun to, right. to mess with it. Yeah. Um, and I took away your ability to decide when the gun goes off mm -hmm. and that's another, um, that's another one that, uh, it kind of leads into sites. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, go down that rabbit hole absolutely rabbit holes are what we're about here so i always put site picture and site alignment together that that almost all the literature i've seen anymore they put site picture site alignment and uh i i kind of thought about like okay what's the context of that well site picture is really important for firing one shot Right. I mean, because break out the dictionary, what's a picture when we say words matter? Well, a picture mm -hmm. is a permanent representation of a past occurrence. That's, that's a little wordy way to say huh. you're taking, you know, <laughs> look at the, if you say, say to somebody, look at this picture of me when I was younger, that picture is always of you when you were younger. All right. right? I, I got, I got to interrupt with a yeah. use of force segue to that. Okay. We're always shooting at the past. That's okay. Yeah. Think about that. Whatever they did to cause us to shoot has already occurred. Has already occurred. Right. So when we put the word picture mm -hmm. into somebody's brain, that's a new shooter. Well, what do we use to take pictures? A camera that has a shutter button that we mm -hmm. use our index finger of our right hand typically, which is 90 some percent of shooters out there. That's what, so I go, are you taking a picture of it or are you seeing this through the entire motion of the process? Because if a picture is a permanent representation of the past, then it's not really a picture, is it? It's a present thing. It's a, it's an in the now thing. Right. So that was kind of like, I, I had some, students go, well, what am I supposed to say to them? I said, well, you, you tell them you want the alignment, but a picture is not a real accurate description. You know, maybe, uh, Matthew little uses the term, a site movie. Yeah. Gabe, gonna... Gabe White originated that. Oh, did he really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think we're going to get like mm -hmm. into all the manuals and, and sure. throw that away, yeah. but, uh, but I literally had picture and I go, okay, well, if you take a picture with a camera, how many people have done that? Like everybody raises their hand. I said, what do you do with the shutter button? They're like, oh, you press the shutter button 
I said, well, what do you have to do with the camera? Like, well, you hold it still. I'm like, okay. Um, are you seeing how we can relate this in context to what we're doing in shooting? I'm like, oh, well, that's a pretty interesting one. And I go, sight alignment. I said, how critical is that? And people are like, oh, it's got to be perfectly centered in the rear notch and perfectly clear. And I said, when we stare at an object in view of another object, right? I said, there's a reason that a viewfinder on a camera is not a stick or a crosshair because it's constantly in motion and you see that motion in reference, right? Well, as, uh, as, as luck would have it, I start talking through this and the guy says, so what are you telling me? Stare at the target? And I said, no, see what you need to see. That's it. You don't worry about it being perfectly aligned because you get sight anxiety. And I came up like, I'm sure somebody else has said that. Uh -huh. So the reason you can't hit something is your body wants to make everything so perfect and still that you can't do it. I mean, we're spinning around at 10,000 and some miles an hour. You're never still. Um, so it started to kind of open the door to what we've been told isn't wrong. It's just in a different context of application. Uh -huh. And that is a really hard thing to differentiate target marksmanship from accurate, uh, accurate combative marksmanship. You know, the ability to place something in a, as was Daryl call it, the, the large orange, the small grapefruit. Uh -huh. Well, the sites have to be perfect to do that. Yes. Uh -huh. And no, Sorry. yes. The further away from the grapefruit we get, right. no, the closer we get to it. Mm -hmm. and uh so that's that's kind of uh for lack of a better term it's like putting things in context for people who have only experienced target marksmanship fundamentals ad nauseum right they're the same thing but it's a much different execution yeah tom Givens loves to put things into driving in car examples and context because that's something most people that are coming to a range have experience with well i think for a younger audience you know that the, the people that are young adults now or teenagers they all walk around with an iphone or an android phone taking videos and pictures all the time so i think your picture analogy is okay we're we're taking a picture of this this target all right that's what we're doing when we shoot it. You're just the, the, the trigger is your shutter button. Right. Yeah. Right. But that, that motion that happens after the picture is taken mm -hmm. is where it starts to become the movie. We have to track sites through recoil and either put them back where they were and do it again or put them somewhere else. Um, we've all seen the shooter that goes boom and the gun comes up in recoil and mm -hmm. their guns over here, their eyes are over there. They're looking at the mm -hmm. pre work down the line. Um, so that's, uh, and with shooting a dot that is absolutely applicable. That dot is never still, it constantly dips, ducks, dives, moves circles. Uh -huh. Um, and we have to be able to take a picture of that with the trigger as soon as it crosses a place on the target that we want to shoot it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's without very, moving the gun as you do. Exactly. Um, so that's kind of the second one is sight picture and sight alignment. Uh -huh. And I shoot a drill that I watched Tom Gibbons shoot that I completely thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. I put a three by five card up and I shoot a plus sign on the edges of it with the gun uh -huh. in the same spot. And it's to drive home the point that, and then I'll, sh I'll shoot it at three yards, five yards and seven yards. And people see that and they can see physically see the guns not aligned. Uh -huh. And it's like, you have to train yourself to be able to pick up the proper amount of information to execute the task at hand that you want to, you yeah. want to achieve. Um, and my dirty little secret target that Michael Burgess and I, I'll show the YouTube viewers has a two inch circle with a one inch dot in it. And if you want to frustrate yourself, go try to hit the dot every single time. You won't be able to do it. You just can't. Uh, and it will induce the anxiety into your grip by trying to get the gun as still as you possibly can. And uh, <laughs> it was pretty, 
pretty funny that I, I was shooting a, a really good group on this at five yards and, and shooting a good group in this two inch circle, some in the dot, a little out of it here and there. And then I take the slack out of the trigger and I have Michael start hitting the timer and I start chewing the center out of the dot. And people were just like mind blown that that could happen in a reactionary time. Uh -huh. But when I had complete and full control over when I'm making the gun go off, it, it was lost. Yeah. Um, so yeah, context, man. It's, it's all <laughs> that's, yeah. that's in my torches. It's all about context. Yeah. You know, Ernest Langdon's got a drill along those lines that I believe he calls the now drill that, uh, I know Spencer keepers uses some and that I've kind of picked up and modified now I, I, in my notes and my outlines, I call it the now drill. And I've got several different ways I run it, depending on whether I got a whistle with me or a timer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and and how to do that um and it's basically there's if you're the student or you're the shooter you're shooting in my time not your time mm -hmm. yeah and, and so there you don't have the, what you're talking about the 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 side anxiety is because you're not deciding when the gun goes off when the gun is fired i'm deciding when the gun is fired yeah the sights are just where they're at mm -hmm. the trick to that drill um or i say the trick the beauty of that drill is when you get students to react to it. If they yeah. hesitate, it, the wheels come off. Mm -hmm. And I use a mod. I, I, I can't remember what I called it in the drill. It was like the, the Langdon drill or something like it was like Vickers and Langdon smashed together on a B8 at five yards um, to force people to have sight anxiety and overcome it. Um, and it's me actually physically grabbing their firing hand and moving the gun out of alignment and telling them when to fire and i had people that would almost wrench their wrench their hands over trying to steer the gun back to the center to fire it mm -hmm. and then i would pull the gun off of the target and they would completely relax because well i'm not shooting at anything i'm shooting at the dirt and they would react to it immediately i start putting in the center of the b8 making them wobble and it was like oh and you can feel it come through their firing grip mm -hmm. And then once they would trust that process, they'd shoot about a four inch circle at five yards, all where I told them to shoot. And it's, um, and it was really cool to be able to demo a lot of those things. Uh, one of the things I, I did for that class, it moved at a really snail's pace for about an hour and a half, uh, because everybody was shooting in front of everybody else and everybody else was watching mm -hmm. and everybody was getting that same treatment on those same drills. And it, it was like, watching somebody get put in in a pressure cooker and then they'd holster up and they're you know they're shaking with adrenaline and all these things and then they go off the line and they're sweating and i'm like and then by the end of the class i've got them at five yards just chewing two inch dots up on their at their own speed and their own pace and then challenging them with hey who wants to shoot this you know me and michael want to do some shooting let's mm -hmm you know, let's get up here and do, you know, let's shoot at the best group we can at five yards and everybody's still watching them, but they're not cognizant of it. So that anxiety goes gone. I'll and throw a Larry Mudgetism at you here. Yeah. We train to overcome tendencies. Okay. And so that's what you got them to do was to overcome their tendencies. Oh, huh. uh, yeah. In, uh, yeah, I like that. That's that's a yeah. really good, uh, really good summation of of, right. of that process. Yeah, I was working with uh, one of our personnel yesterday on the range, and I was doing some of uh, Larry Mudge's skip loading that we discussed in the last two episodes. Mm -hmm. And she, she, you know, after a couple of magazines full of the skip loading process, she really started, you know, really getting that trigger pressed down without moving the gun. And uh, all of a sudden she stops. She says, I'm seeing the front sight better. It's not moving as much up and down, you know, during when I fire an actual shot. I said, that's because you're not moving the gun before you fire the shot. Funny how that works. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's still right there when the shot goes off and then it's returning right there. And instead of being somewhere else. And so it's easier to see. Yeah it's really abundantly clear. Um, and that's, that's the one, uh, 
the one thing I'm really trying to drive home with a lot of instructors and a lot of shooters, it's, it's not that I'm reinventing the wheel or that I've come up with some new concept, but if you start looking at this stuff in reverse, what do all those fundamentals have in common? Every single one of them does what? It's made to train you to not move the gun before you set the gun off. That's literally it. That's why we've compounded all these complicated concepts. Um, and it's all to overcome your body's tendency to tighten up, brace for impact. Um, you know, it's like you've probably worked a number of DUI crashes. Why does the drunk never get hurt? Because he never sees it coming and he's relaxed when it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why do I get in a fender bender and I'm in the chiropractor's office for a month? Because I go, oh, no, how, right? Yeah. Uh, it never happened to me in a police car, right? Nobody's ever, you know, hit me in a car, right? Yeah. Right. So big lights and yeah, whatever. But, uh, but that, if you start looking at the fundamentals from that angle of, uh, you know, what is stance there to do? Like, you know, okay. And why do we make a production of where your feet are at? We, we learned how to stand up somewhere around eight, nine months old and not fall down because fall down hurts. Right. Why do I have to change that to shoot? There might be some, op some tuning, some optimization right. there. Um, grip on a gun. I've heard, I've heard people say grip the gun naturally. What's natural about gripping a pipe bomb, yeah. <laughs> right? Like what other thing do you equate that to in life that is natural about putting your hands on something that's going to explode? Yeah. Um, just 4th of July, you know, adults, we light the firecracker in our hand and throw it away. So we move away from the explosion and now you're telling me I got to hold on to it. Yep. Eh, there's nothing natural about that. Um, you know, the sight picture, sight alignment, those things mm -hmm. stare at the front sight. Why? Uh, and let the shot surprise you get the surprise break. Well, it's also that you don't prepare for that and move the gun out of alignment. And, you know, it, shooting PPC, the funniest thing that I've discovered lately is I, I broke out my PPC, my distinguished 686, right? So I just shot match five with it. Mm -hmm. And I go out and I take target focus at 50 yards and I shot a better group the other day than I ever did for all the years of practice that I've shot. And I could not, I'm like, Oh, I feel like I've lied to myself for 20 years. Why? Um, well, it's because I wasn't trying to put those sights anywhere. I was just looking at the target and holding the sights in reference to it. Tim Heron inspired me to do that one. And I should have videoed it and I should have like taken <laughs> pictures of it. Cause I went, no, no, I spent, I spent years smoking sights with carbide and trying to make them the perfect shade of different than the target and, you know, wiping, a, a, taking a scribe and marking the center of the target. And it was all for not because all that did was encourage my brain to try to make it better. And, uh, you know, it was like, setting in a green light with my finger or my foot on the accelerator and waiting for it to get more green before I touched it. Yeah. So anyway, there's your rabbit hole for the evening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A uh, quick funny story about surprise break. Uh, years ago, we, we had a new officer. Um, this is back when I was in the PD that really was not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but, yeah. could sh but could shoot phenomenally i'm talking about it was it was just works of art when the guy mm -hmm. would shoot and some of us you know crusty guys were sitting around one day and they were like how come he can't do anything else well but he shoots so good and i said guys the answer to that simple and they well, what's that i said he is literally surprised each and every time the gun goes off so yeah 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 and so he's never jerked the or snatched the gun or moved the gun jerked the trigger whatever because he literally is surprised each time it happens yeah yeah the uh the 
it's it was so that usually gets a bigger laugh than that thank you sir <laughs> sorry <laughs> I, I was sitting here processing that and i'm like oh my god i've met that kid yeah. i've met that kid probably 20 times you know uh, but but yeah but but i started um uh, the eye-opening thing <laughs> the eye-opening thing for the whole process was i i as I've, I've kind of Daryl's inspired me to go down the rabbit hole of where did this stuff come from, mm-hmm. uh, which he's uh, he's mentored David Cagle to a degree that can only be described as obsessive, right? Uh-huh. Like get, here's your homework. And a lot of it is stuff I had forgotten. And then I go back and I start uh-huh. putting those pieces back together. Uh, you know, Cagle is getting it in a year. Yeah. It took me 18, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, but the eye-opening thing was the amount of people that even were tenured shooters that came to that class and were like, I've never heard that addressed that way. Um, and I, even though I understood what it meant, I didn't really understand the context of how it applied. And I told, I told it this poor guy, he was an NRA instructor and I could see steam like almost shooting out of his ears and he was pacing back and forth. And I'm like, dude, are you all right? You're all right, buddy. He's like, what am I supposed to tell my students? And I look at him and go, "What, what do you mean, man? He goes, you just took everything I've ever taught anyone and threw it on the ground, stomped on it, lit it on fire. And then like, he goes, what, what am I supposed to tell him? And I'm like, uh, stance, grip, side alignment, trigger control, all these things, but just have the understanding that that's not why they're missing the target. Uh-huh. They're missing because they're doing something that they're moving the gun. That's the bottom line. Yeah. They're moving the gun. So I'm giving you methods that you can implement to get them to stop moving the gun and just trust every trust the process. And he goes, Oh, okay. Well, so I think well, that's, that's where right. you're, you're taking the picture analogy really comes into play because we try to stress that shooting is the, the continued application of all the, the fundamentals or the essentials together because I see some people when they miss is they're doing all the things that we tell them, but they're doing them sequentially and not continually. And I think people can understand to take the picture. Okay, I've got the, 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 the shot that I want framed. Now I have to press the shutter without blurring the picture. Okay, I've got the, the sights, the, the sight relationship to the target that, that I want. Now I have to press the trigger and take that picture without disturbing it and blurring it. Yeah, and we do it with a camera all the time. Uh-huh. whack the shutter button all to pieces but for some but the shutter button doesn't make it explode uh-huh. right so uh-huh. i it, but that and <laughs> the the number of <laughs> the number of times that I, I that i heard uh oh, what was the, the other example i was going to give was that we we talked through the fundamentals and like okay this is this is how it goes um and i I said, how many weaver shooters do I have? And this is the first class I've ever had people raise their hand. And they're, they're fairly new, new shooters. I would say, Mm -hmm. you know, probably handgun class, a couple of NRA safety classes, some USCCA safety classes, um, you know, maybe some entry level type instructor development. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me about it. Tell me what it, what it is. And everyone would say, well, it starts with their feet. And I'm like, hmm. Okay. That's not weaver. Yeah. And, and and then one one lady, and I, I felt really bad. Like she said, Well, every class I've been to, they won't let me shoot like that. And I'm like, well, why not? Well, they say it's not right anymore. And I'm like, who is this they? Because I'd like to find they and go, what's wrong with they? Um, it worked just fine for you know 50 years, but so I pull up this picture on my phone and I go, here, pass this around. And I'll let everybody look at it. And they're like, Ooh. I say, anybody know who that is? And they're like, no. I said, that's Jack Weaver. Does that look anything like what you were taught? And they go, huh? Like, I, you know, it was really pretty eye opening. And I think on the instructor side, we take a lot of that stuff for granted that when we say these things, 
people automatically associate what they know with that concept. And when we go in with that assumption, this reminded me of what Daryl said the other night, when you go in with that assumption, you're going to gloss over somebody with the fundamentals in some way, stare at the front site. Well, the site that was in front of me was the rear one. That one you told on it. I'm like, that's a prime example um, that when we say, well, you're a weaver shooter. I don't, you know, I don't agree with that because of this, that, or the other. And why not? Well, your feet are in the wrong spot. It doesn't have anything to do with your feet, pal. Like, but that's the way you were taught or me or Uh whoever. So, you know, on the instructor development side, I try to encourage people, Hey, look at this stuff from the other side and look at where it came from. And it will become a, abundantly clear how convoluted this whole process has become when it all breaks down to pull the trigger without moving the gun. Yeah. That yeah. can't find anything better than just a, hey, I don't care how you pull it, slap it, jerk it, yeah. smack it, put a wrench in there and have somebody hit it. Like a la John McPhee. It really isn't that critical as long as we don't move the gun out of alignment. Right. And uh, you know, that, uh, grip site, a lot of people grip sights and trigger. That's absolutely true because those three things, if you don't have them in balance, one of them's got to be really good or better than the right. others, right? Uh, but if you've got a decent grip on the gun and decent alignment on the sights, what's does it really matter how you pull the trigger? Nah. Does it really matter if it surprises you? It's like, uh, but people, you know, especially newer students, they just they dive in on, well, I, I knew that shot was coming. Well, oh, yeah, you're pulling the trigger. Of course, it's going to, at the end of that, it's going to go pow. Uh, so anyway, it's just yeah. the thoughts that run through my mind are. You know, Larry Mudgett spent a little bit of time on on the Weaver and mm-hmm. what it, the true definition of it was in, in the class we just took out there. And he made the point of saying that at the end of their lives, Weaver and Cooper were so tired of arguing with people what the Weaver stance or what Weaver is. And the definition is, is you're using isometric tension, the actual position of your arms and your feet. None of that matters. Do it however you want to do it. But isometric tension on the gun is the definition of Weaver, according to Weaver. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> that was pretty. It, that, that's like uh, I'm spoiling it. If anybody ever pays me for mm. an open enrollment class, now I have mm. a big picture of Jack Weaver, mm-hmm. and it looks like he's shooting the stance that most of the Johnny Cool Guy shooters now do with mm-hmm. from the feet down. Yeah. And I go, hmm. And and I always pose the question. I'm like, any Weaver shooters? Who's this? How's that look? Show me how you were taught. Oh, well, it's yeah. got to be bladed. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, well, here's the guy they named that after. Does that look anything like what you're... Oh, no. Yeah. Um, when I got into law enforcement, the big argument was we're teaching... Uh, we started... Uh, my class or the one before, they started teaching the uh, isosceles stance. And it looked like the 1941 OSS square footed you know and i went that's not how i learned it yeah and then well we used to shoot weaver and i'm like well what's that look like you know i posed the Mm -hmm. i'm I'm the ignorant one in the back what's a weaver stance and i see it and i go that's not the way i was taught i don't know and when i was in the shooting circles on the east coast there were still dudes shooting weaver yeah like in 2001 2002 and it didn't look anything like the way that police agencies were teaching it. So right. uh, that's been a real fun conversation yeah. as of late. So, yeah. Well, is there anything else on this topic that you want to discuss that I haven't asked you about? Um, no, I guess they need to come to it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. That's a plug for my class. No, yeah. um, no, not really. I just, uh, well, I'll take it back as, as an instructor, the one thing I'll give people for instructor development is go figure out, do what Daryl Bulky is mentoring Kegel to do right now. Go figure out where a lot of this stuff came from. 
Um, and the other point too, that I will get is I shot every single person's gun almost with like one or two exceptions in that class, uh, with Michael Burgess on a timer, you know, just checking to see where their groups were hitting after we'd gotten five or 10 rounds down range. If I saw something weird, I would go, Hey, let me see your gun. Mm -hmm. and I'd grab Michael in the timer and I'd take the slack out of the trigger and I'd have him decide when the gun goes off. So that way I can't cheat it. I right. can't see the round go up here and then go, Oh, I need to hold off a little mm -hmm. bit because this gun's out of alignment. And yeah. I would shoot a group. Um, and it didn't matter the gun because being a gun guy or a gun person or a student of the gun, um, I encourage everyone. If the Glock 17 is the only pistol, you know, that's awesome. But if you're going to teach, you better know everybody else's guns well enough to function and shoot. Right. Them. Yep. Um, yeah, I had some guns I'd never laid hands on before and mm -hmm. picked them up and shot them. And I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. Stick with mine, but that's cool. You know, some of the Walthers <laughs> showed up and I'm like, yeah, hey, let me see where that gun shoots. Uh, um, and I was really pleasantly surprised at how many of those guns had come into the class with bone stock factory sites that were actually regulated, that the point of impact was pretty well regulated to the gun. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. we're in the golden era. So there you go about it yeah what do you got coming up uh let's see i'm going to set through daryl bulky's uh uh habits of highly successful gunfighters his eight-hour presentation here mm -hmm. for uh, law enforcement officers he's he's driving up here to uh brahms country to put that on yeah and uh after that i'm going to gun sight podcast are still uh releasing one tomorrow morning with daryl mm -hmm. um i had to delay that because one of my podcasts uh, buddies had Daryl and Wayne on, and I didn't think that'd be appropriate to release it that day. So I thought, well, I'll just delay this one a few days. Uh, I got a phone call from another Georgia gentleman this morning uh, who told me, he says, I, I talked to Eastridge already today. And he says, Dang it, every time I've got a show, Wings beats me to it. <laughs> well, it was, it was funny. And the topic that we did was completely removed yeah. from what you guys, you guys did a really good recap on uh, Larry Mudgett's deal. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to the revolver roundup. So I'm dusting off some revolvers that I haven't yeah. shot in several years. And there's a couple that are really sentimental to me that I'm taking with me to mm -hmm. shoot in, uh, Eric, I won't say his last name because bulky's probably tipsy by now. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric's blocks and some other mm -hmm. blocks, um, and, uh, doing that in, in November, and then December, I am going off the rate, the training radar for mm -hmm. a while. Uh, and then I'm going to kick some, kick up the open enrollment classes again next year, probably in March. Okay. Um, I've got uh, a company that's going to manage that side of it because I don't have time right yeah. now. So uh, I got a, I got an offer for, um, well, I won't say an offer. It's just a service that, that manages instructor networks. So. Uh, I'm going to be talking to those guys in January and February. So March, I'll probably do a little more roadshow training. Uh, the podcast, I'm trying to drop them every Thursday um, on the off or off duty on duty podcast on all the platforms. And then uh, let's see, other than that, trying to talk myself out of buying a 1956 Martin D18 uh, guitar. I will be no help in trying to talk you out of that. It's a steep, it's a, it's a steep challenge. I'm gonna have to teach a lot more open enrollment classes. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty well it in a nutshell, sure. man. I always enjoy doing doing your podcast because it <laughs> takes the pressure for questions <laughs> off of me. Well, there you go. It was, it was, um, we've already mentioned Jack Weaver uh, uh -huh. today and we've mentioned Cooper. Uh, would be remiss if we did not point out that Mr. Eldon Carl passed away this weekend. Uh, after um, he was injured, I believe he was riding a motorcycle and was was struck by a car, and there was a long deteriorating process that led to his death. But uh, if I understand those facts correctly, but Mr. Eldon Carl died this past weekend. Uh, Eldon Carl was one of the original five combat masters, as named by Jeff Cooper. Uh, so get out your Google machine and search the original combat masters, 
and you will find plenty of information on them. Eldon Carl maintained a, actually a pretty good web page with lots of information on it. And those are the guys that, you know, in the 50s and 60s, formed the basis of what would become the modern technique and the basis of, you know, American small arms training from the 1970s on and that we are refining and everything still to this day. Um, in a future episode, probably in about a month because he's out traveling to a bunch of classes, uh, Tom Givens will be on and we are going to uh, start basically in the era in which you discussed, the, the post Great War era and go through like the J. Henry Fitzgerald, the Henry Bowmans and everything. And we're gonna go up that up through Cooper founding gun site and basically the leather slap you know because we did that episode with daryl where we talked about the uh, uh the spread of the modern technique on the west coast and then we've had a couple of budget episodes uh that were just really drilled in the depth in that and so tom and i are going to come do an episode where we kind of bring the audience up to speed on what was everything transpiring up until that point yeah. and how we got there from here and then i'm going to uh i've got another a couple of things along those lines uh, because I've gotten really interested in the geographic development of firearms training as well because you know on the west coast or you know western United States you had gun sight driving it well there's not an east coast analog but there may be some other kind of regional things for us here in Georgia we can trace our roots back to mid-south mm. because that's where all the guys that went to the public safety training center and that taught a vol that's been around since the 70s, that's where they all went and got their initial big training, plus some of the other other schools, uh, like Smith and Wesson Academy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so gun sight really didn't have a big effect on us here in Georgia, but I'm going to I'm trying to work on some more regional contacts as far as what was going on. Uh, anything Oklahoma specific as far as that goes that you know yeah. about? Yeah. So Oklahoma was the melting pot of where everything uh you know, East Coast, mm -hmm. West Coast, and then FBI. All right. So most of our shoulder fired technique came from FBI. Mm -hmm. Most of our handgun technique was a mashup of PPC and modern technique. Okay. So it was a real melting pot of, uh, because we're wedged right in the middle, equidistant right. from each coast. Right. So, uh, but the FBI had a lot of influence in the Midwest uh, on firearms instruction. Yeah. So that held over with guys that, you know, I mean, I had a, my agency back in the, either the late sixties or early seventies put together a national championship team. Yeah. So, you know, and those guys were the range staff. So you can imagine how the influence of that played in. Uh, and your agency was the home of, Delph, a jelly brass was indeed, and which is odd because the FBI structured a lot of shooting programs around him. Mm -hmm. We had a nationals. I can't remember. It, it's I think it was Jack Garrett and Phil Kennedy won the nationals in seventy three or sixty eight somewhere somewhere in that time frame. So PPC shooters, jelly Bryce, and then. You had, uh, when our SWAT teams came together in the seventies were really, uh, there was a couple of Israeli people that came over and taught, uh, okay. in the Midwest. So right. it was a, it was chilly, man. It was potluck chilly day for <laughs> firearms instruction here in the Midwest. Uh, it's odd. Uh, uh and then. In recent times, it's been um, a lot more modern tech, uh, not modern technique, but a lot more competition-based stuff has come mm -hmm. along. Yeah. At my agency, we've got a, we've got a uh, Marine Corps pistol team shooter on my agency that that guy can spin my head talking about eye fatigue, you know, yeah. uh, to guys that are modern samurai project instructors to you know, people like me that have been to pretty much everybody's yeah. spiel. Um, so it's, 
it, it's still kind of a melting pot. There's not an allegiance to some methodology right. there. So, yeah. um, interesting place. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I've got a line on somebody that's a retired FBI fire instructor that I think maybe if I can get that gentleman on, on for an episode to kind of discuss you know, the FBI's role during that whole era too, because as we discussed in the episode with Wayne and Daryl and, and then the previous one, it was the FBI's core mission for a long time was they were supposed to be training state and local law enforcement. They've gotten completely away from that with a couple of minor exceptions. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's still some active FBI training going on out of the uh, Birmingham field office. Uh, And there may be some somewhere else in the country that I'm not aware of, but I know they are. Um, We had, um, Speaking of FBI, I'll put you in contact with a guy who was, uh, he's a very good friend of mine, FBI firearms instructor. He was assigned out at Quantico at the lab when they were doing the 10 millimeter testing. That's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, and he was the guy carrying the torch for submachine gun and carbine schools in the Midwest, Oklahoma, okay. Texas, Kansas. Uh, and he lives, he lives about 45 minutes from me and I'll, uh, I'll reach out to him and put you in touch sure. with him. He's fascinating cat. So, cool. yeah, so, so, yeah, so that, that's where we're heading, uh, with some future episodes. Um, uh, the, the show numbers are kind of, we, we, we gotten where we've topped that 200 plateau on the podcast side, uh, pretty regular here lately. Uh, the YouTube channel versions, typically get in, up into the 250, 300. So combined, they're up around 500 or so uh, per episode within, you know, a couple of weeks of them, of, them, of them dropping. Usually that first week, we get about 200 and then it starts to, to, to peter off after that. Uh, but that's where we're going. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Zach and Bill for becoming uh, show sponsors. If you go, if you're following this on the podcast feed and the show notes, there's a link where you can become a direct reporter, a supporter of the program and all the revenue that it comes in from the program. I'm going to try to put back into equipment and maybe increase the production value of this a little bit. Cause right now I'm just recording the episodes on zoom, taking the file and uploading it directly to YouTube and taking the file and uploading it directly to anchor with no other production whatsoever done to it. And, you know, maybe we can uh, increase the production value with a little better equipment. Uh, so for those of you that are playing along, Thank you for your time and thank you to Brian. Thanks, Lee.